The first speaker is going to be Alexander Daniel. Uh, he's a research fellow at um, Nottingham University, and he's going to talk to us about the Ukraine uh, Kidney Analysis Tool, Data Analysis for Multi-Vendor Studies. Looking forward to hearing from you. Great, uh, and thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to speak. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, analysis of multi-vendor studies. Um, so just a bit of an overview of the talk or an outline. I'm going to tell you what, we'll start off with what Ukraine is. Um, then, because it's the first uh, talk of the session, a bit of an overview as to why we actually want open source analysis software. Uh, then go through UCAT, uh, another tool we made called XNAT QC, um, and then round it off with some conclusions. Um, so starting off with the background, um, Ukraine is the United Kingdom Renal Imaging Network. Work. And it came about quite a few years ago as sort of a bit of an informal uh, collaboration between a lot of the sites that were doing renal imaging in the UK. Um, and we're kind of a good number of sites in the UK where it's not, we're not in direct competition with, say, one other site, um, but there's not so many of us that it becomes difficult to work on one project together. Um, and this sort of uh, Ukraine was formalized a bit more through the Ukraine MAPS project, where MAPS is MRI acquisition and processing standardization. Um, and that had a few aims, one of which was to set up a multi-parametric quantitative um, acquisition and analysis protocol. So the idea behind that is that we can run essentially the same, uh, acquire the same data, um, no matter where in the UK we're acquiring it. Um, we also, as part of this, did a traveling kidney study where eight subjects went around the UK and were scanned on um, scanners from three different vendors. So GE, Siemens, and Philips are the three vendors that we've harmonized uh, in this project. Um, and then we can test all of our protocols, both the acquisition and the analysis side of things. Um, out of the Ukraine project, we now have the Affirm study, which is ongoing at the moment. And that's essentially using that nice harmonized protocol uh, to study chronic kidney disease, or CKD. Um, and over the course of the study, we're going to determine if there are any um, biomarkers in the quantitative renal MRI data that uh, correlate well with disease progression. Um, and to do this, we're scanning 400 participants, um, which while Nottingham is a reasonable sized city, we wouldn't be able to recruit 400 CKD subjects uh, over our recruitment window. So it necessitates scanning across 10 different sites in the UK, and that means that we end up scanning on three different vendors. So this is why um, it's quite important that we have these harmonized protocols uh, that work across different vendors and different sites. Um, so, and the, the sort of um, acquisition side of things is fairly self-explanatory. You don't want to acquire different echo times at different sites with different vendors, because that's going to lead to different contrasts, which leads to different results to your data. Um, but the acquisition side, like a lot of scanners can produce maps, quantitative maps on the scanner. Um, so here's some example T1 data on the left, um, and we want to get a T1 map. Why can't we just export that from the scanner? Well, A, not all scanners do export um, maps straight away, particularly if it's a sort of um, hatched or a, a sequence that's required a bit of tweaking of the source code. Um, so it's not always an option. Um, but in the cases where it is, well, how would we go about doing it? That's perhaps the first step. Well, to go through it very quickly, you'd look at a single voxel, you'd see how the signal changes with time. We know roughly what model it should be following, um, and we can take some guesses uh, S0 and T1, and that'll give us a sort of curve that we fit to. We can adjust those parameters till um, the data fits the equation, um, and then that gives us our values of T1 and S0 that we can put in our map. If I was to do that, I would use SciPy's curve fit function, um, which the input arguments are all here. Um, and there's quite a lot of them. There's a lot of different ways you can use this function. You could say initialize it with different guesses of S0 and T1. You could use different bounds of your guesses. So um, saying that we know that we aren't going to get negative T1. So you could very easily say that as between zero and plus infinity. But we also know that in the body or in the brain, you're not going to end up with T1s that are say of the orders of minutes. So you can bring that down quite a lot. Um, but what if, someone uses a slightly different value for those. And the chances of MR vendors, GE, Siemens, Philips, actually using, well, for a start, SciPy, um, and then the chances of them even using the same input arguments is essentially zero. And the worst part is we don't even know what they're doing because it's all proprietary software. Um, it's a black box. And yes, some people have access to the source code for these scanners, um, but there aren't many people that have access to all three. Um, so this is why we want to have uh, open source analysis tools uh, so that we actually, A, know what's going on, and B, we're doing consistent analysis across vendors. 
Um, so with that in mind, we produced the Ukraine Kidney Analysis Toolbox, which is a framework for harmonized quantitative MRI analysis of the kidneys and beyond um, in the same way that FSL is designed to work with the brain, but we can use it in the body. Uh, UCAT is designed to be the other way around, so it works well with the kidneys, but can be used for other areas. Um, so what are the aims of it? Well, most of the projects that we've done in Ukraine, we've tried to keep quite modular. Um, and with that in mind, UCAT is just an analysis package. It basically takes uh, NumPy arrays and some metadata, be it echo times, inversion times, that kind of thing, and outputs your quantitative maps as a NumPy array. So all stuff like reading and writing DICOMs or nifties, that's not handled by UCAT. Um, so that's why from that previous slide, the most important word is framework, because you can then build other tools using UCAT. And uh, we'll cover a bit more about that later. Um, it has a focus on the kidneys, um, as you would kind of expect because of the name, um, but it is designed to work with other areas of the body as well where possible. So things like the kidney segmentation doesn't work very well when you give it a brain, um, funnily enough, but things like T1 mapping works quite nicely. Um, and yes, the, the sort of initialization values might not be perfect, but it should work reasonably well. And at least you have the advantage of the fact that it's open source and it's consistent across vendors. Um, we want it to be easy to use. Uh, there's no point in developing these tools and them just being useful for, say, the Affirm project. Um, we want it to live on for longer than just one study. Um, so with that in mind, we try to keep it as well documented, have nice examples. And we have developed it so it goes hand in hand with the Ukraine acquisition protocol. Um, so it's all, all the default arguments work very nicely with that Ukraine acquisition protocol. So it works out of the box uh, and makes life easier for those that just sort of want to acquire renal MRI data without having to do too much either acquisition or analysis development. And finally, we want it to be stable. Um, while I wouldn't recommend upgrading your analysis packages halfway through a study, um, we do want to know uh, any changes that we've made to UCAT, how that impacts the results that it's going to produce. Um, and again, we'll cover a bit more about that in a couple of slides of time. So what kind of things does UCAT actually do? Um, well, some of these, most of these have already been implemented. There are some that are in the late stages of development and there are some that are on the pipeline. Um, but uh, we have things like registration, uh, particularly model-driven registration, which is where uh, you use sort of how closely uh, each voxel fits to the empirical model uh, to drive your deformation. Um, we have QA tools, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about the signal-to-noise ratio stuff later. Um, segmentation as well, so things like AI kidney segmentation, um, segmenting the tissues within the kidneys, and uh, layer-based analysis. So instead of looking at regions of interest based on tissue, you can look at the voxels as sort of a function of depth from the renal cortex. Um, we have relaxometry as well, um, with lots of different models within each of these. Um, diffusion, which I'm going to go over relatively quickly because I'm aware that uh, the next speaker is from DiPi. But um, what I will say is that we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, so things like the DCI parts of UCAT are essentially wrappers for DiPi that just make it work a bit easier and uh, nicely with the Ukraine acquisition protocol. Um, and finally, some perfusion measures. So does it actually work? And a sort of an example of why we need it, basically. Uh, this is some data from the traveling kidney study. Um, so this is the same subject scanned on two different scanners uh, from two different vendors. And the column on the left is the T2 maps that are generated on the scanner. And the column on the right is the T2 maps that have been generated by UCAT. So we can see that even though this is the same subject, so the T2 values should be the same, um, the, the results produced on the scanner by vendor one are much lower T2s than those produced by vendor two. And we can see that in the histograms over here. Um, whereas if we take the exact same raw data uh, and run it through UCAT instead to do our T2 map calculations, then we get much more consistent results. And this is kind of showing the advantage of UCAT that A, it's open source, so we actually know what's going on. We know that we are running the exact same model on both of these. Um, so I don't know whether, say, vendor one is doing some stimulated echo compensation or not, and that might be why it's giving different results. Who knows? It's a black box. Um, whereas by taking the same data and running it through UCAT, we know that we've done the exact same analysis process. We know what's happening. And it means that when we write papers on it, we can say, okay, well, we have the exact same uh, protocol being used for both of them. Um, and that's reflected by the fact that, yeah, the T2 values across both subjects are now much, well, across the same subject, but both vendors are a lot more consistent. To try and make UCAT as uh, useful as possible for other people, um, 
we've tried to make it as easy to install as possible. So it is just a pip package. Uh, we'll make a condo package in the not too distant future. Um, it's well documented, so you end up with sort of tool tips as you're uh, coding. And there are tutorial notebooks as well. Um, and these all come with sample data. So it means if you're trying to get someone started uh, with using UCAP, say, to do kidney segmentation, which is what's going on in this one, um, you can just send them the link to that and then they can run it through with the sample data and then adapt that to work with their own data. So it's a nice sort of starting point um, to make the learning curve as uh, easy as possible. From a stability point of view, uh, this is just a screenshot from the GitHub homepage. Uh, and the key bits from stability here are these two boxes, which means that it's uh, got a test suite and that it's got really high coverage. Um, so for those of you that haven't come across sort of the ideas of test suites, it means that every time we do a commit to the GitHub repo or release a new version of uh, UCAT, um, a load of uh, code is run basically that does uses all the functions that we've produced um, and compares them to uh, specified values and expected values. It means that we then know if our changes to code have actually changed the results that we're going to get, um, which is really important. It might have changed it for the better, but at least we know, and it means we don't end up with any accidental changes to results halfway through um, a study or something. Um, and also this test suites run uh, not just on one system either. Uh, it's tested on multiple different versions of Python right the way from 3.8 through to 3.11 at the moment, 3.12, there's some dependency issues upstream, um, but I would like to think they'll be fixed fairly soon. Um, and it's also tested at the moment on um, Windows and Linux, but again, it does actually pass on Mac. Um, it's just a case of um, merging that in. I'm gonna wait for Python 3.12 to be supported first before doing that. Um, and the number on the right here, the 98%, means that 98% of the lines of code in UCA are covered by these test suites. So it's a really stable and um, robust uh, piece of software, basically. And that means it's, you can use it in lots of different ways because it is just a platform and a sort of a framework you can build uh, other things with. So um, as some examples, here's it being used just with some local scripting. So say you've just done sort of one scanning session uh, to prototype something um, and you want to just quickly analyze the data. I do that on my Windows desktop machine, just writing scripts in Spider. Um, we can also use it on our high performance cluster um, to process, say, 400 data sets for the Affirm study. Um, we can do that, and that's obviously running on Linux. Um, and we can also use it through graphical user interfaces. So this is a piece of software called Weasel, um, which has been written by other members of Ukraine. Um, and in the back end of that, if you ask it to make a T1 map, then it's using UCAT um, to do that. And it means that basically, and that's running on Mac. Um, so all three use cases of this, if you give it the same uh, input data, it'll give you the same uh, outputs, which is again, really helpful from a harmonization point of view that we can do analysis on any platform uh, and we can acquire our data on any scanner and we'll be getting the exact same results. And that's all sort of tested and guaranteed um, by UCAT. Um, the next bit I'm going to talk about is another tool that we developed to help with multi-vendor, uh, multi multi-site studies, um, which is XNAP QC. Um, so this is all about making sure that the data you acquire uh, conforms to any uh, acquisition protocols that you've spent a lot of time harmonizing them. You want to make sure that the data is actually acquired according to them. Um, so if you've not come across XNAP before, it's uh, essentially an online image data repository. And it means that instead of the way that multi-site studies often used to work, where you would acquire all of the subjects worth of data at one site, uh, and then once you've acquired all of your subjects, say, 50 subjects, you would then send that to the data analysis center. Um, instead of that, you can use XNAT, which um, means that you basically upload it to an online portal as soon as the data is acquired. Uh, and that means that then the analysis center can pick up the data whenever they want, or they can do the processing as it goes as soon as it's uploaded. Um, it also means that we can do some QA uh, as soon as the data is uploaded. So with that in mind, we've produced a couple of tools. One called DICOM QC that looks at the DICOM metadata um, and checks that the acquisition protocol is followed. And another one called ISNR QC that looks at the voxel data and checks it is of sufficient quality. So DICOM QC looks at DICOM tags and the image acquisition parameters and compares them to the expected values for the protocol. Um, so things like the, the matrix size, number of slices, phase and code direction, parallel acquisition factors, uh, bandwidths, echo times, all sorts of stuff. The, the key parts of your protocol are basically specified in a spreadsheet. And then as soon as some data is uploaded to XNAP, automatically each series is then checked against the expected values. Um, 
And this then produces these sorts of reports. Uh, that means it's very easy to quickly flag, uh, oh, okay, well, on that subject, uh, for some reason, they changed the parallel acquisition factor. And then the investigators can alert the acquisition site straight away to the fact that there's been a protocol deviation. And then for the next subject that they scan, they can fix that. And it means instead of having, say, a protocol deviation halfway through your study and then half the data being different, the first half being different to the second half, instead you end up with just one subject that's a protocol deviation. Um, so it means you end up with this sort of rapid feedback um, and much more consistent data. The other tool is ISNR QC. Um, which runs for us on two representative scans, so a, a spin echo and a gradient echo anatomical. Um, and that uses UCAT to calculate the signal to noise ratio of each of those scans. And then that puts that back to XNAT as a custom variable. And again, that means that you can alert sites if there's, say, potentially a coil out on their array um, and the signal to noise ratio has dropped. Or you can download a whole study's worth of data and start analyzing sort of which sites have the highest SNR and which vendors are potentially the lower SNR, that kind of thing. So to start wrapping things up, um, we quickly talked about why we actually want open source analysis software and why it's particularly important for large multi-site, multi-vendor studies. Um, and then covered a couple of tools that we've produced to help with that, one of which is UCAP for data analysis um, that could be used in all sorts of different ways, things like scripting, GUIs, HPC. Um, and the other one is XNAT QC, which means that you can then have confidence in the fact that your data that you've acquired actually conforms to that uh, harmonized protocol that you spend a long time uh, working on. So if you want to find out any more about uh, any of these tools, then there's a lot of links here. I'd recommend you perhaps take a screenshot rather than trying to copy any of them down. Um, so this is the link to UCAT, uh, the XNAT QC tools. If you want to find out more about Ugrim Maps, then there's a website here and just some other uh, open source tools that we've produced as part of Ukraine. Um, there's kidney segmentation tools, uh, Weasel, which is that GUI that I was showing you earlier, and dbdicom, which is the tool that we use for reading and writing DICOM files nice and easily, um, and also integrate as well with Weasel. So all that remains is for me to thank those people that I've worked with on this work. So uh, there's the people I work with here in Nottingham in the building, and those that I work with via a webcam across the United Kingdom uh, as part of Ukraine. And also thank you to the funders that funded this research. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to find out more of that, so link to UCAT. Um, feel free to drop me an email if you have any questions or ask away in the chat box. Um, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>